Advent last Sunday by lighting by lighting the first candle, the candle of hope. We light it again today to remind us that Christ is indeed coming to fulfill God's promises. Today we light a second candle, the candle of peace. The prophet Isaiah said, comfort, comfort my people to a nation anxious about invasion and exile as he foretold the coming of a prince of peace. Our world is still filled with violence. It is still filled with abuse. It is filled with families that are torn apart by war and where children in parts of our world are used as soldiers. Isaiah's words continue to speak to us that Jesus is the one that will bring us to an everlasting peace. Mary and Joseph found no room at the inn to give birth to Jesus, but we can heed John the Baptist's command to make room in our own hearts. Whenever there is war or mistrust between people, families, or even in our own hearts, God is present and leading us to imagine new ways in which we can live in peace. Christ, indeed, is our only hope and our peace is found only through him. We light this candle to remind us of Jesus's life-giving peace to all who trust him. We light it in honor of those who live the gospel truth that war does not make one great. The peace workers who risk so much so that others may live free of fear, they, they are the ones who make our world great. Let us pray. O root of Jesse, O peace, stir up your power within us, that in this time we may await with abundant expectation the fulfillment of your eternal presence in creation. For you live and reign among us, maker, savior, and giver of life, one God, now and forever. Amen. All those that are able, would you please rise and join me in the call to worship? 
Christ, the one who was and is and is to come, welcomes you to this place. As one body and one voice, we honor and glorify the giver of hope, peace, love, and joy. Amen. So be it. Our opening hymn is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 82. Saints, let us trust in God's love for us and confess our sin, confident in God's mercy. Gracious and welcoming God, have mercy on your people. We confess that we do not believe in your incarnation. We do not heed your word every day in all that we say and do. We do not see our neighbors, families, and friends as beloved children who have made. In your mercy, forgive us, for we repent of our ways and look at your power to head us and raise us up, so that at the last you will gather us to you and give us peace. Amen. The reign of God has come near. The repentant will be judged with righteousness. You are forgiven. Be filled with hope, believing in the power of the risen Christ to bring you to new life. Rejoice and believe. Amen.
Good morning. What is it we're waiting for? Christmas, that's right. What, what do we remember happened at Christmas time? The, the very first Christmas. A little, a little baby named Jesus, that's right. Now, take a look behind you and look up. You see, th see that, see those figures up there? That is a picture and a model of the manger, and it reminds us of Jesus coming. It reminds us of God's promise. Long before there was a Jesus, the prophets promised that God would come and live with them. The song we just heard, Emmanuel, that name, Emmanuel, literally means God with us. Well, there are other ways that God promises to be with us as well. What do I have in my hand? Water. Water make you think of God? No. No, no it doesn't. But it can. It can when we use this water in a special way, when we set it aside for a special purpose with God, like when we open it up, take this lid off, and pour this water in here. What do we, what do, we do with this big wooden thing here? When, when people come up here and we put water in here, we baptize them, that's right. Baptism is another sign that God is with us, that God loves us, and that God has claimed us as his own. Jesus himself, when he came with us, also was baptized. He was baptized by his cousin. What was his cousin's name? It begins with a J. John, his cousin was named John. In fact, we call him John the Baptist. And he came and he even baptized his own cousin, Jesus. So that when we are baptized as well, we're doing something that Jesus did as well. And we remember that Jesus is always with us, that Jesus loves us, and that Jesus will always be with us. So as we prepare for Christmas to remember that Jesus came, we do so and remember that Jesus is always with us now. So before you guys head out and go down the aisle to Miss Katie down there, will you pray with me? All right, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the gift of baptism. Thank you for the promise that it makes real to us. Help us to remember that not only did you come, but that you will come again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, see you guys next time. Our responsive reading on uh, what has turned into a snowy Sunday is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. You can find those words on page 575 and 576. But before we read together God's word, let us first pray for God's wisdom. <coughs> Excuse me. Holy One, through your Holy Spirit, interact, instruct us by the light of your prophets. Illumine our hearts that we may hear your call to become your path into the world. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now let us read together from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. I will read the odd verses. You please respond with the even verses. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meat of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. 
Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand over the adder's den. Then they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the days the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the people, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Those words can be found on page 808 of your pew Bible. Listen again for God's word. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of our Lord. Advent has always been a time of preparation, a time of getting ourselves ready. We look forward during this season of coming for the coming of God in the flesh, to the coming of the kingdom of God in our very midst. Yet last week, we hear words not of the most wonderful time of the year, but words of judgment. We think, sheesh, glad that was over. Now we can really move into the joyous time of the holidays, right? Then we run smack into John the Baptist, and we realize this is not the case. We realize that the preparation, preparation for God, preparation for the kingdom, it requires more than our best efforts at being charitable. It requires more than our best intentions of being people of good cheer. It requires a better makeup job than what we do to try to make our lives, our deepest selves, seem better or cleaner or purer than they really are. John hits us right between the eyes. And while we're blinded, he then gets in a good one in the gut, all the while setting us up to be pushed over somebody kneeling down behind us. This God thing that John is talking about, the preparing for God, this is tough. It is painful. It is even costly work. Most wonderful time of the year indeed. In Advent, in that time before we celebrate the joy of the nativity, during that time of society when we are swept up with the lights and the music and the shopping, we come to texts such as these to prepare 
not only our minds, but our hearts for the king who will come and to realize that our ideals wrapped up in those lights and music and gifts, they are ours. That's not God's promises for us. That's our promises for ourselves. God's promises, they come in in the form of a baby. They come in this wooden box with a bowl for holding water. That is what it's about. Those are God's promises for us. In the waters of baptism, just as we did last week, we encounter both hope and peace because of God's great love for us. Baptism is many things, but it is first and foremost a sign of God's promise to us, recognizing the reality that we love because God first loved us. Last week, we heard that judgment is coming. On the week of hope, judgment is coming. How hopeful is that? There is no denying the reality. It is all through scripture. Jesus comes with a sword. Scripture is very plain about this. Yet there is indeed hope because that judge that is coming, we know that judge. That judge knows us as well and we know the judge, Jesus Christ, is on our side. We know that the judgment, the verdict is already in, that God is for us. Yet so often we hear that message as a message of cheap grace, that we are okay just as we are We are saved, so now we can go back to doing what we were doing before because it doesn't really matter. There's no real cost to us. But John, John will have none of that, though. Using and instituting what has become a sacrament in our life together, John shows that these abundant, these cleansing, these hope-filled waters are indeed troubled waters and troubling waters for us. As much hope, peace, love, and joy, as much grace as is conveyed in these waters, they are troubling for us. They are troubling because these waters dare, if we look into them beyond the surface, if we are willing to look at it, they tell us we don't measure up. We are not good enough. We are lacking. More than this, these troubled waters tell us that this is not okay. It has been said before that God loves us just the way we are. That is true, God does. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. But it is also true that God loves us far too much to leave us the way we are found. That is it, that is repentance. The repentance that John demands, the one that he's screaming about, yelling, too often we say, though, nope, I'm good. We're, we're all stocked up here. John insists we are not okay, that we must repent. But repentance is, just as judgment last week, it is a word of hope. Because repentance is fundamentally not about our designs and our intentions, but God's. And about God's desire that we realign ourselves and our lives in the light and in the model of Jesus Christ. Similarly, baptism is God's promise. God's promise of claiming us in its waters. That in those waters we are given, and if we dare to, we receive a new identity in Christ. As sure as judgment is a promise in scripture, so too is the promise of a new identity in Christ as being one of God's own chosen and beloved in baptism. These are indeed words of hope, even words of deep, deep love. We often experience judgment or a call to repentance as something very dark something to be avoided, something that makes us feel shame or guilt, makes us feel that something in us is lacking, and it is. But as any parent can tell you, as any family member, as any true friend knows, we often love most deeply those in our lives that we dare to say the truth to, that we want more for you, better 
for you. Our concern, our recognition that there is something lacking, it comes hopefully from that same point of concern that God has for us. Because we know if God did not care, if God did not think his standards mattered, if really there was no true cost to us, does God really care about us then? To just leave us floundering in our own good intentions? No. If God didn't care about these things, what that really says is God does not really truly care about us about making us into God's image. God would have no standards. It really would be a, you know what, you're okay. Keep mucking up your life because everything's just fine, just the way it is. That's not true love. That is not true concern. That is not the love God has for us. While on the surface we would experience relief, thank goodness that judgment is over, we would know in our heart of hearts that God really doesn't care about us, doesn't care about what goes on in our lives. God doesn't care enough to say there's a still more perfect way. But no, these waters, the promise that they hold, they tell us just how much God loves us. God loves us so much to never give up on us but also loves us so much to never stop calling us back from our own best intentions or our own worst motives. John calls out to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's calling out to us when he does so. He's not calling out to the people who don't come to church. No, he's calling out to the ones that are there every Sunday. He's calling out to you and to me. He's not screaming, repent, you tax collectors. Repent, you sinners, you Samaritans. No, he's calling out the good people, the decent people, the in-order church people of the day. Because for all the fluff, all the wrapping that we put on our lives, what lies within us, John and God dare to say, is not right and good, no matter how much we try to make it so. God loves us just as we are. It lets us know we are welcome. It lets us know we are home, we are safe. Nothing we can do will ever make God love us anymore. And nothing we do could make God love us any less than God already does. God loves us, period. Those words are words of benediction that my mentor often uses when he closes a service of worship in his church. And they are true. God loves us, period nothing more to say. But make no mistake, these words carry and imply a deeper truth. That this love, a love that is this deep, that is this wide and this open, can only come at a great cost to ourselves. Because it is quite simply a love that will never, ever, ever let us go. It is a love that will not leave us as we are found. It is a transformative love that we enter into, that we acknowledge when we pass through these waters. We acknowledge that that love will indeed, if we receive it, will change us. So let us continue. Continue to let God love us. Continue to let God change us. Continue to let God help us prepare for this hope and this peace that will love us to life this day and every day. we respond to God's word, we do so lifting our needs and our concerns, as well as our joys and blessings, to God in prayer. Today, as we come to our time of prayer, we pray for the families of Ramona Kinney and Marcella Pittenger, two longtime beloved members of our congregation who have passed away in the preceding week. We pray for Glenn Push who is in the hospital this day with severe pain in his legs. We pray thanks, thanks to God for the healing and the recovery of Larry Bruns over these past days and weeks. 
We pray for those not with us today, those far away in need, the victims of a warehouse fire in Oakland and the wildfire victims in eastern Tennessee. Are there any other needs and concerns or maybe joys and blessings we would share with God and with one another? Yes. Pray for Mario Sr. for a safe trip back home. Is. It is a very happy birthday to Jordan and to all celebrating a birthday uh, during this time of preparation. Seeing and hearing no others, let us carry these as well as what remains on our hearts and minds to God in prayer. We come to you this day, O oh God, with a deepening anticipation of your birth among us, and we thank you for the gift of your love. We pray for your church throughout the world, for all the ministries that build up the body of Christ, that in many ways and many vocations we may serve to your glory. We pray for our nation and for all nations, remembering especially those who are victims of injustice. We pray for our own elected leaders and for all leaders, that they will govern us with courage and equity. We pray for all in need, for the sick, the destitute, and the dying, for strangers in our land, for the ones who remain invisible, for the elderly and for small children, for parents, grandparents, and guardians, for those who live alone, and for those who live lonely in the midst of family. We remember with mercy those who sleep without shelter, those who are overworked, and those who have no work, stir up in us a capacity to see ourselves in their own struggles and to act so that others may live life and have life abundant. We pray for this community, for our neighbors, for our friends, for those with whom we study and work. Guide and strengthen all people in our common life together to know the gifts of your grace and your love that will not let us go. May all that we ask and all that you see is needed in our world be given to your people, through Christ our Lord, in whose name and way we now pray, saying, Our Father. Mighty God, Holy One, Divine. 
Come now to the table of our Lord and celebrate the communion of our Lord with us. But before we come to this table, let us as God's people claim before one another and before God what it is we believe by reciting the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. They can be found on page 35 of your hymnal. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Third day he rose from from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our God is one who loves us, who welcomes us, and invites us. But our God is also one who at times troubles us, makes us uncomfortable, makes us unsure. Yet at the same time, we know that God provides for us. We know that when we are in need, God meets those needs. We know that in God there is always shelter, protection, and provision. Similarly, we know at this table God is made plain to us, inviting us, calling us, and finding us here. We come so often knowing all the ways in which we do not measure up, all the ways that we follow the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the ways we follow everything else but Christ our Lord, all of the ways that should not be permitted. Yet we are called and still we are invited to this table to be drawn into the presence of our Lord and Savior. It is through nothing that we have done, but only through the one, Jesus Christ, who has paid our admission to this table, and it is he that bids us come. And so, as we do through the season of Advent, we come. Let us pray. May the bread we break and the cup we bless be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ until that day, until that great and promised day when we will feast with all of the saints and with you in your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, O God, one God, now and forever. Amen. When we come to this table, we come... And we remember that on the night Jesus was arrested and betrayed, he 
gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And after taking a loaf of bread and giving thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, This is my body given for you. Take, eat, remember me. In the same way, when the meal was finished, he took the cup, and as he poured the wine, he said to them, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Friends, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord. great God of grace and light. The reality of your presence with us is truly something we experience rather than fully understand. Help us to remain connected with you and with one another in this season of Advent and beyond. Help us to do together what we cannot do alone. Help us to be your people doing your will in your world. In Jesus' most holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our sending hymn, number 88, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And we will sing verses 1 and 4. Friends, may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together we may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Alleluia.